Well, hello, virtual audience. Uh, my name is Philip Nelson. I'm at University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I've been asked to give you a little talk about the effects of greenhouse gases on some of the nearby planets in our solar system. Of course, climate is a scary topic. It's scary when we think about our future, but it's also scary scientifically. You know, climate scientists, they seem to know about the trade winds and the effects of the continents and the wobble of the Earth's orbit and basically all of science enters into climate. And uh, it gets worse than that because everything today seems to rely on gigantic simulations that make assumptions that normal people or even me can't seem to understand. I was just wondered, is there any entry level aspect maybe supported by a non-trivial observation I could make myself, maybe a classroom demonstration that I could show to students that uh, gives a little insight into what's going on beyond the simplest possible models. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Of course, many physics students have been exposed to models of the warming influence of increasing carbon dioxide, but often by a very simple model that I'm gonna call one blanket. And it's a good start, but it leaves you kind of wondering about some questions that go way back all the way to the very beginning of climate science these are objections to uh, the greenhouse theory right from the beginning, and you still hear them to this day. The first one says the most abundant greenhouse gas by far is water, and we can't control that. You know, there's just the oceans evaporating. So uh, how can reducing carbon dioxide make any difference at all? Okay, it's a fair question, and it's one that deserves a good answer. And then a little bit more technical, in the carbon dioxide absorption bands, they're already completely opaque. So uh, you can't get more than 100% absorption, so how could adding more carbon dioxide even matter? That's another good question that deserves an answer. So uh, let's see what we can say. I think every citizen needs some crisp qualitative answers to questions like that. So let's see how good a job we could do. Some textbooks just jump from the super simplified model into uh, conclusions of state-of-the-art cir general circulation models, and then you just have to take that on faith. I wondered if we could do something in between and bridge that gap. Okay, so here's some old historical data from the 19th century, and uh, every physics student is familiar with the black body spectrum. This is just the spectrum of energy being emitted by a hot object at various temperatures. And uh, for our purposes, what we're going to want to know is that the total power per area given off by such a hot body uh, depends on temperature to the raised to the fourth power. Could we see that for ourselves without just taking somebody's word for it? Well, I got some light bulbs. I got one light bulb. I got one light bulb, and I ran it at two different... Uh, power levels. I ran it at one level and got the spectrum with this little spectrophotometer. Then I ran it at another level and got its spectrum. I was able to fit both of those to the black body curve, assuming various temperatures for them. Uh, so there's two fitting parameters, which is not too much. And uh, then I took the ratio of those temperatures and raised it to the fourth power. And lo and behold, that was the ratio of the power, 75 watts to 53 watts. So yeah, that does seem to tend to confirm the Stefan Boltzmann law which uh, then we're gonna feed into climate science with a little bit more confidence. So that was one demonstration. So how did that give us anything about climate? Well, here's a simple feedback model explaining something about the temperature of a planet, a rocky planet with no atmosphere or very little atmosphere. Uh, in my metaphor, I've got a bucket and the bucket has some water going in that represents incoming solar radiation. And there's a leak at the bottom of the buff bucket that represents a radiation back into space. And how fast the water leaks out depends on the pressure at the bottom of the bucket. So you can see what happens in the bucket metaphor. Everybody has a sort of feeling for that. The water level will rise up until the pressure at the bottom selects an outflow rate with, that matches the inflow rate, and then you'll hit a steady state. Okay, so if you substitute uh, energy flows for water flows, uh, then this is a model for climate. Now, uh, the surface temperature rises until the re-radiation of infrared out into space matches the incoming radiation, and then you get a steady state. And uh, that works great for planets like Mars or the moon, you know, planets without significant atmosphere. The only problem is that it's a complete disaster as a prediction for the climate of Earth or Venus. Okay, so we must have left something out for Earth and Venus, and if, uh, it's well known. We left out the effect of atmosphere. Uh, so let, let's see what we can do about that. Well, what's something that's convenient is that the energy flow, the downwelling energy flow at the surface of the Earth can be cleanly divided into two pieces. There's a short wavelength piece, which is coming from the sun. But then there's this long wavelength bump that you can see in this graph, which is coming from a re-radiation of infrared by the Earth's atmosphere. 
So I can separate those out and look at them distinctly. And uh, it's a bit of a surprise to discover that the uh, downwelling solar radiation landing on the Earth is actually outweighed by the downwelling radiation from the Earth's atmosphere. The atmospheric re-radiation back down to the Earth exceeds the incoming solar. So, all right, what we left off was that red curve, and it's enormous. It's a big effect. So let's think about what it does. Uh, I can think of another cartoon model that's easy to think about. Uh, I can have an energy input like me underneath my blankets, and when I put more blankets, then I'm going to get a higher um, steady state temperature just because they are reflecting some energy back down to me. Uh, my temperature has to go up in order for the total, in order to get to steady state. And in the atmospheric context, there's panel A, which is showing you the, um, the naked planet situation that I talked about before. Planet B has some gas molecules, and some of them are intercepting infrared and re-radiating it back out to space, fine, but some of them are re-radiating it back down to the surface. That's what we saw in the previous slide. Okay, so that's the element that we forgot about before. That's what we need to have. Remember that to get a steady state, every watt that comes in must be leave out to outer space. Okay, so can we make that a little bit more, put that on a little bit stronger footing? Do, should we really believe that there are infrared active gases? Which, infra, which gases are infrared? Here comes Eunice Newton Foote, who did an amazing experiment and uh, was then almost completely forgotten. Her work has only been recently rediscovered, even though she uh, published it in a reputable journal before Tyndall. So, all right, she just documented the uh, absorption of energy from light by various gases. They all look transparent, but uh, some absorbed the energy and some didn't. This lends itself to uh, reconstruction in a classroom demonstration. Uh, here we've got two coffee cans. Coffee cans are identical, except one of them contains dry air and the other one contains dry carbon dioxide. I got two identical infrared light sources in front of them. I irradiate them for a minute or so, and uh, then I remove the sources and just look at what I get in an infrared camera. Okay, so uh, there they are again. Uh, there they are before the irradiation. They're both at the same temperature. You're just looking straight through the back wall behind them. But after irradiation, one of them is a lot warmer than the other one. The only difference between those two cans was their contents. Both contained trans gases that were invisible in, in the visible, but one of them apparently absorbs infrared light. So in that way, you make it a little bit more plausible to students that there is something going on there that fits into that model. So why should carbon dioxide be so different from air, which is mostly oxygen, nitrogen, and argon? Why should they be so different? Well, a molecule like O2 or N2 has no dipole moment, no electric dipole moment. Therefore, it doesn't interact very much with light. And um, you can't make it interact very much with light because there's no such thing as bending a diatomic molecule. A more complicated molecule like CO2, even if it has no dipole moment to begin with, once you bend it, it acquires a dipole moment. So there can be a coupling between uh, vibrational states and light. And uh, that's what makes carbon dioxide infrared active. Other molecules like water uh, have a permanent dipole moment. They're even more infrared active. Okay, so that's one thing we learn from physics. Uh, also from physics leads us to expect, and then we see experimentally that the absorption spectra are very complex. They have all these little bands. We'll get back to that in a little bit. I'm just pointing out that this is something that is experimentally measured. Okay, so let's get back to that realistic cartoon. Yes, we can have solar radiation hitting the Earth, warming up the Earth, Earth re-radiating infrared. Infrared sometimes gets waylaid on its way back out to space and re-radiated back down. That's what I've talked about so far. But there's another important kind of energy transport that I haven't mentioned yet, which is convection. Okay, convection, that's that thing on the far right of the lower figure. Uh, that's another way of energy transport. And now it seems like it's gonna get really complicated, but uh, sometimes you luck out, okay? Convection isn't really all that difficult because in all sorts of atmospheres, there's, there's a troposphere where the gradient of temperature is quite uniform. The gradient of temperature is, is, is defined by the onset of convection. And the threshold for the onset of convection is determined just by fundamental constants just the acceleration of gravity on whichever planet that is, and the specific heat of whatever gas of, of, the, of the atmosphere, uh, that determines the convection threshold, that determines the temperature gradient, which is called the lapse rate, and it's, doesn't, it's not affected if you change the composition of the atmosphere. 
If you just add a little bit of CO2, that's not going to affect that lapse rate. So uh, convection isn't really all that complicated. And in the lower regions of the atmosphere, the ones that are opaque to infrared, uh, convection is the main principal means of energy transport. It's convection all the way up to the top of the troposphere. The last infrared active layer, the last infrared opaque layer, is the one that radiates by the Stefan Boltzmann law. So this gives us a really simple way of thinking about the effects of changing the composition of the atmosphere. If you add more CO2 to the atmosphere, then it stays opaque to a higher altitude. The altitude of the last infrared opaque layer, that's the one whose temperature is determined by the Stefan Boltzmann law. If you raise that altitude a little bit higher by adding more CO2 and the lapse rate is constant, unchanged, then the intercept of that graph is going to move over to the right. You're going to get a higher surface temperature. That's all there is to the greenhouse effect. Okay, you raise the top of the troposphere at a fixed lapse rate, that's going to increase the surface temperature. Uh, I should point out as well, that if you instead change the insulation, if you send in more solar energy, or if you reflect less solar energy, so this, the net is greater, uh, with the same lapse rate, you're also going to get a higher temperature. And that one's super cause for concern, of course, because the net insulation rate is what comes in minus what gets reflected, and what gets reflected is largely reflected by polar ice caps on Earth. If you lose polar ice caps, that increases the insulation, which raises the surface temperature, which uh, leads you into a positive feedback loop, which is bad. Okay, we can also get some idea about the difference between Venus and Earth. They both have atmospheres, uh, but Venus has a whole lot more carbon dioxide. Even though its net insulation is less than the Earth, because it's more reflective than the Earth, uh, that last surface is way, way higher than it was on Earth, with a similar lapse rate, means that the surface temperature is hot enough to melt lead. Okay. So now we understand some differences between Earth, Venus, and Mars, and we got some idea about how greenhouses works. Now it's time for just a little bit more realism. Uh, I mentioned that uh, spectra are actually complex. The height of the last infrared opaque layer actually depends on wavelength. So if there's an absorption window and you shrink it down and you narrow that absorption window, uh, that's gonna affect surface temperature as well. The height of the last opaque layer depends on wavelength, and you can trade some low ones for some high ones if you change the, the spectrum. How can you change the spectrum? You can change the composition of the atmosphere. That's what we're worried about. And here it's important to note that the average of a function of x is not the same thing as finding the average of x and applying the function. The function that I'm thinking about right now is the Beer-Lambert law that goes from cross-section to give you the total absorption. And in the top panel, I've got the total absorption spectrum in the uh, range close to 15 micrometers for a pre-industrial level of carbon dioxide. It's pretty complicated. And yes, there is a big fat band there that's completely opaque to infrared. Underneath it, I've got a hypothetical future case, which is maybe not all that hypothetical in which the uh, level of carbon dioxide is doubled relative to the pre-industrial levels. And it looks kind of similar, but look at all those uh, magenta arrows there. Those are all places where the total absorption went up. Gaps between uh, absorption bands either disappeared or got smaller. And uh, this is what you get when you increase. The wings of the distributions change a lot. And you get extra absorption. Well, that's relevant to one of the questions that we started with. Uh, let's get back to those. The most abundant greenhouse gas by far is water and we have no control over it. So how could CO2 emission be relevant? I'll come back to the second one. The answer to the first one is that carbon dioxide absorbs in a wavelength band where water doesn't, okay? So if you raise carbon dioxide, uh, then that's gonna cause extra absorption because that's a place where the water, the pre-existing water wasn't absorbing. Furthermore, once the atmosphere temperature goes up, that uh, changes the partitioning at the oceans, put lofts even more water into, uh, into the atmosphere with even with a self-amplifying greenhouse effect. So that's an answer to the first of those questions. Second one, if the carbon dioxide absorption bands is already completely opaque and you can't exceed 100%, then so what if you add more carbon dioxide? So we answered that as well. The wings of each individual peak become more and more important as carbon dioxide in concentration increases. Out in the wings, the absorption is not 100%, but it can rise up 
Of course, it can never get higher than 100%, but uh, even in the gray gas model, when you increase absorption, that increases the altitude of the blast infrared opaque layer, that increases the surface temperature. So I want to thank you for your attention. Here's some places where you can read more about the things that I've talked about today. And uh, thanks again.